On Prayer in the Contemplative Life, Part 6 Chapter 13 Must Prayer Necessarily Be Attentive? That even holy men sometimes suffer distraction of mind when at prayer is clear from the words, My heart hath forsaken me. This question particularly concerns vocal prayer, and for its solution we must know that a thing is said to be necessary in two senses. Firstly, in the sense that by it is a certain end is more readily attained, and in this sense attention is absolutely requisite in prayer. But a thing is said to be necessary also because it is a certain thing, cannot attain its object at all. Now the effect or object of prayer is threefold. Its first effect, an effect indeed, which is common to all acts springing from charity, is merit. But to secure this effect it is not necessarily required that attention should be kept up throughout the prayer, but the initial intention with which a man comes to prayer renders the whole prayer meritorious, as indeed is the case in all other meritorious acts. The second effect of prayer is peculiar to it, and that is to obtain favors. And for this, too, the primary intention suffices, and to it God principally looks. But if the primary intention is wanting, prayer is not meritorious, neither can it win favors. For, as St. Gregory says, God hears not the prayer of a man who, when he prays, does not give heed to God. The third effect of prayer is that which it immediately and actually brings about, namely the spiritual refreshment of the soul. And to attain this end, attention is necessarily required in prayer. Whence it is said, If I pray in a tongue, my understanding is without fruit. At the same time, we must remember that there is a freefold species of attention which may find place in our vocal prayer, one by which a man attends to the words he recites and is careful to make no mistake in them, another by which he attends to the meaning of the words, and a third by which he attends to the end of all prayer, namely God himself, and to object for what which he is praying, and this species of attention is most necessarily of all the one which even uninstructed folk can have. Sometimes, indeed, the intensity which the mind is born towards God is, as says Hugh of St. Victor, so overwhelming that the mind is oblivious of all else. Some, however, argue that prayer must of necessity be attentive. Thus, 1. It is said in St. John's Gospel, God is a spirit, and they that adore him must adore him in spirit and truth. But inattentive prayer is not in spirit. But he prays in spirit and in truth, who comes to pray moved by the impulse of the spirit, even though, owing to human infirmity, his mind afterward wanders. 2. But again, prayer is the ascent of the mind towards God. But when prayer is inattentive, the mind does not ascend towards God. But the human mind cannot, owing to nature's weakness, long remain on high, for the soul is dragged down to lower things by the weight of human infirmity, and hence it happens that when the mind of one who prays ascends towards God in contemplation, it suddenly wanders away from him owing to his infirmity. 3. Lastly, prayer must needs be without sin. But not without sin does a man suffer distraction of mind when he prays, for he seems to mock God, just as if one were to speak, and his fellow man and not attend to what he said. Consequently, St. Basil says, the divine 
assistance is to be implored, not remissly, nor with a mind that wanders here or there. For such a one not only will not obtain what he asks, but will rather be mocking God. Of course, if a man purposely allowed his mind to wander in prayer, he, should, he would commit a sin and hinder the fruit of his prayer. Again, such St. Augustine says in his rule, When you pray to gods and psalms and hymns, entertain your heart with what your lips are reciting. But that distraction of mind which is unintentional does not destroy the fruit of prayer. Hence St. Basil also, also says, But if through the weakness of sinful nature you cannot pray with attention, restrain your imagination as far as you can, and God will pardon you, inasmuch as it is not from negligence but from weakness that you are unable to occupy yourself with him as you should. Cajetan. Does a man satisfy the precept of the church if, being bound to the recitation of the divine office, he sets out with the intention of meditating upon the divine goodness or upon the passion of Christ, thus keeping his mind firmly fixed upon God? Clearly a man who strives to keep his mind occupied during the whole of the divine office with contemplation of and devout affections towards God and divine things, fully satisfies his obligation. So, too, a man who aims at meditation on the passion of Christ and devout affectations on it during the whole office undoubtedly sanctifies his obligation for he is making use of a better means for keeping in touch with the div divinity than if he merely dwelt upon the meaning of the words. At the same time, he must be ready to lay this aside if in the course of the office he finds himself uplifted to divine things, for at this he must primarily aim. The one who prays, then, must make the passion of Christ a means and not an end. He must, that is, be prepared to ascend whereby, if God grants it, to divine things. In short, we may make use of any one of the species of attention enumerated above, provided we do not exclude the higher forms. Thus, for example, if a man feels that it is more suited to his small capacity to aim simply at making no mistakes, and habitually makes use of this form of attention, he must still use it as a means only. He must, that is, be at God's disposition, for God may have mercy upon him and grant him, by reason of his dispositions, some better form of attention. Again, when a person prays for things needful for his support in life, he must not be so occupied with the thought of these things as to appear to subordinate divine things to human, as though prayer was what a being means in his daily living to the end. We must bear in mind the doctrine laid down above, that all our prayers should tend to the attainment of grace and glory. We must occupy ourselves with the thought of eternal glory, or of the glory of the adoption of sons during this life, or with the virtues, as, as a means to arriving at our eternal home, and as the adornment of the inhabitants of heaven, and the commencement here of heavenly conversation, such things as these must be counted as the highest forms of attention. St. Augustine, give joy to the soul of thy servant, for to thee, O Lord, I have lifted up my soul. For thou, O Lord, art sweet and mild. It seems to me that he calls God mild because he endures all our vagaries and only awaits our prayers that he may perfect us. 
And when we offer him our prayers, he accepts them gratefully and hears them out. Neither does he reflect on the careless ways in which we pour them out. He even accepts prayers of which we are hardly conscious. For, brethren, what man is there would put up well with a friend of his began a conversation with him, and yet, just when he was ready to reply to what his friend said, should discover that he was paying no attention to him, but was saying something to someone else? Or supposing you were to appeal to a judge, and were to appoint a place for him to hear your appeal, then suddenly, while you were talking to him, were to put him aside and begin to gossip with a friend, how long would he put up with you? And yet God puts up with the hearts of so many who pray to him, and who yet are thinking of other things, even evil things, even wicked things, things hateful to God. For even to think of unnecessary things is an insult to God with whom you have begun to talk. For your prayer is a conversation with God. When you read, God speaks to you. When you pray, you speak to God. And you may picture God saying to you, You forget how often you have stood before me and have thought such idle and superfluous things and have so rarely poured out to me an attentive and definite prayer. But thou, O Lord, art sweet and mild. Thou art sweet, bearing with me. But thou, O Lord, art sweet and mild. Thou art sweet, bearing with me. It is from weakness that I slip away. Heal me, and I shall stand. Strengthen me, and I shall be firm. But until thou dost so, bear with me. For, O thou, O Lord, art sweet and mild. St. Augustine Praise the Lord, O my soul. What mean these things, brethren? We do not raise praise the Lord. We do not sing hymns day by day. We do not our mouths, each according to their measure, sound forth day by day the praises of God. And what is it we praise? This is a great thing that we praise, but that wherewith we praise is weak as yet. When does the singer fill up the praises of him whom he sings? A man stands and sings before God, often for a long space, but oftentimes, whilst his lips move to frame the words of his song, his thoughts fly away to I know what desires. So too our mind has sometimes been fixed on praising God in a definite manner, but our soul has flitted away, led hither and thither by diverse desires, and anxious cares. And then our mind, as though from up above, has looked down upon the soul as is flitted to and fro, and has seemed to turn to it and address its uneasy wanderings, saying to it, Praise the Lord, O my soul! Why art thou anxious about other things than him? Why busy thyself with the mortal things on earth? And then our soul, as though weighted down and unable to stand firm as it should, replies to our mind, I will praise the Lord in my life. What does it say? In my life. Why? Because now I am in my death. Rouse yourself then, and say, Praise the Lord, O my soul. And your soul will reply to you, I praise him as much as I can, though it is but weakly, in small measure, and with little strength. But why so? Because while you are in the body, absent from the Lord, and why do you praise the Lord so imperfectly, and with so little fixi fixity of attention? Asks Holy Scripture, The corruptible body weighed down the soul, and the earthly habitation press down the mind that museth upon many things. O oh, take away then my body which weigheth me down 
the soul, and then I will praise the Lord. Take away my earthly habitation, which presseth down the mind, that museth upon many things, so that, instead of many things, I may be occupied with the one thing alone, and may praise the Lord. But as long as I am as I am, we cannot, for I am weighed down. What then? Wilt thou be silent? Wilt thou never perfectly praise the Lord? I will praise the Lord in my life. My spirit is in anguish within me. My heart within me is troubled. I remembered the days of old, meditating on all works. I meditated on the works of thy hands. I stretched forth my hands to thee. My soul is as earth without water unto thee. Hear me speedily, O Lord. My heart, my faith, hath fainted away. St. Thomas The fruits of prayer are twofold. For first there is the merit which thereby accrues to a man, and secondly there is the spiritual consolation and devotion which is begotten of prayer. And he who does not attend or does not understand his prayer loses that fruit which is spiritual consolation, but we cannot say that he loses that fruit which is merit, for then we should have to say that very many prayers were without merit, since a, man, since a man can hardly say the Lord's Prayer without some distraction of mind. Hence we must rather say that when a person is praying and is sometimes distracted from what he is saying, or, more generally, when a person is occupied with some meritorious work and does not continuously and at every moment reflect that he is doing it for God, his work does not cease to be meritorious. And the reason is that in meritorious acts directed to a right end, it is not re requisite that our intention should be referred to that end at every moment, but the influence of the intention with which we begun persists throughout even though we now and again be distracted in some particular point, and the influence of this intention renders the whole body of what we do meritorious unless be it be broken off by reason of some contrary affection intruding itself, and diverting us from the end we have first in view, to some other view contrary to it. And we must be remembered that there are three kinds of attention. The first is the attention to the words that we are actually saying. Sometimes this is harmful, for it may hinder devotion. The second is attention to the means of the words, and this, too, may be harmful, though not gravely so. The third is attention to the goal of our prayers, and this better and almost necessary. Chapter 14. Should our prayers be long? It would seem that we ought to pray continuously, for our Lord said, we ought always to pray and not to faint. Also St. Paul, pray without ceasing. But we must notice that when we speak of prayer, we can mean either prayer, considered in itself, or the cause of prayer. Now the cause of prayer is the desire of the love of God, and all prayer ought to spring from his desire which is, indeed continuous in us, whether actually or virtually, since this desire virtually remains in everything which we do from charity. But we ought to do all things for the glory of God. Whether you eat or whether you drink, or whatsoever else you do, do all to the glory of God. In this sense, then, Prayer ought to be continual. Hence St. Augusta says to Proba, Therefore, by our desire, 
our hope and our charity, we are always praying, for our desire is continued. But prayer considered in itself cannot be continuous, for we must needs be occupied with other things. Hence St. Augustine says in the same place, at certain intervals, at diverse hours and times, we pray to God in words, so that by these outward signs of things we may admonish ourselves, and may learn what progress we have made in the same desire, and may stir ourselves up to increase it. But the quantity of a thing has to be determined by its purpose, just as a draught has to be proportioned to the health of a man who takes it. Consequently, it is fitting that prayer should only last so long as it avails to stir up in us the fervor of interior desire. When it exceeds this measure, and its prolongation only results in weariness, it must not be prolonged further. Hence St. Augustine also says to Proba, The brethren in Egypt are said to have had frequent prayers, but they were exceedingly brief, hardly more than eager ejaculations, and they adopted this method, lest, if they prolong their prayer, that vigilant attention which is requisite for prayer should lose its keen edge, and become dulled. And thus they clearly show that this same attention, just as it is not to be forced if it fails to last, so neither is it to be quickly broken off if it does last. And just as we have to pay attention to this in our private prayers and to have guided by our powers of attention, so must we observe the same principles in public prayer where we have to be governed by the people's devotion. Some, however, argue that our prayers ought not to be continual. Thus, one, our Lord said, When you are praying, speak not much. But it is not easy to see how a man can pray long without speaking much, more especially if it is the question of vocal prayer. But St. Augustine says to Proba, to prolong our prayer does not involve much speaking. Much speaking is one thing. The unceasing desire of the heart is another. Indeed, we are told of the Lord himself that he passed the whole night in the prayer of God, and again that, being in agony, he prayed the longer, and this that he might afford us an example. And Augustine adds a little later, much speaking in prayer is to be avoided, but not much petition, for its fervent attention lasts. For much speaking in, pay, in prayer means the use of superfluous words when we pray for something necessary, but much petition means that with unceasing and devout stirrings of the heart we knock at his door whom, to whom we pray, and this is often a matter rather of groans than of words, of weeping than of speaking. 2. Further, prayer is but the unfolding of our desires. But our desires are holy in proportion as they are confined to one thing. In accordance with those words of the psalmist, one thing I have asked of the Lord, and this I will seek after. Whence it would seem to follow that our prayers are acceptable to God, just in proportion to their brevity. But to prolong our prayer does not mean that we ask for many things, but that our hearts are continuously set upon one object for which we yearn. 3. Once more, it is unlawful for a man to transgress the limits which God himself had fixed, especially in matters which touch the divine worship. According to the words, charge the people lest they should have a mind to pass the limits to see the Lord, and a very great multitude of them should perish. 
but God himself has assigned limits by, to our prayers by instituting the Lord's Prayer. Thus shalt thou pray. Hence we ought not to extend our prayer beyond these limits. But our Lord did not institute this prayer with a view to tying us down exclusively to these words when we pray, but to show us that the scope of our prayer should be limited to asking only for the things contained in it. Whatever form of words we may use, or whatever may our thoughts be. 4. And lastly, with regard to the words of our Lord, that we ought always to pray and not to faint, and those of St. Paul, pray without ceasing. We must remark that a man prays without ceasing, either because of the unceasing nature of his desire, as we have above explained, because he does not fail to pray at the appointed times, or because of the effect which his prayer has, whether upon himself, since even when he has finished praying he still remains devout, or upon others, as, for instance, when a man by some kind of action induces others to pray for him, whereas he himself desists from the, his prayer, our soul waiteth for the Lord. For he is our helper and protector. For in him our hearts shall rejoice, and in his holy name we have trusted. Let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us as we have hoped in thee. 15. Is prayer meritorious? On the words of the psalmist, My prayer shall be turned into my bosom. The interlinear gloss has, If it is of no profit to them for whom it is offered, at least I myself shall not lose my reward. A reward, however, that can only be due to merit. Prayer, then, is meritorious. As we have said above, prayer has, besides the effect of spiritual consolation which it brings with it, a twofold power regarding the future, the power, namely, of meriting and that of winning favors, but prayer, as indeed every other virtuous act, derives its power of meriting from that root, which is charity, and the true and proper object of charity is that eternal good, the enjoyment of which we merit. Now prayer proceeds from the charity by means of the virtue of religion, whose proper act is prayer. There accompany, accompany it, however, certain other virtues which are prerequisite for a good prayer, namely faith and humility. For it belongs to the virtue of religion to offer our prayers to God, while to charity belongs the desire of that attainment of which we seek in prayer. And faith is necessary as regards God to whom we pray, for we must, of course, believe that from him we can obtain what we ask. Humility, too, is called for on the part of the petitioner, for he must acknowledge his own needs. And devotion also is necessary, though this comes under religion of which is the first act, it conditions all subsequent effects. And its power of obtaining f favors prayers owes to the grace of God to whom we pray, and who, indeed, induces us to pray. Hence St. Augustine says, He would not urge us to ask unless he were ready to give. And St. Chrysostom, He never refuses his mercy to them who pray, since it is he who, in his loving-kindness, stirs them up, so they may not be weary in prayer. But some say that prayer cannot be meritorious. Thus, 1. Merit proceeds from grace, but prayer precedes grace, since it is precisely by prayer that we win grace. Your Father from heaven will give the good spirit to them who ask him, but prayer 
like any other virtuous act, cannot be meritorious without that grace which makes us pleasing to God. Yet even that prayer which wins for the grace for which renders us pleasing to God must proceed from some grace, that is, from some gratuitous gift. For, as Augustine say, to prayer, to pray at all is a gift of God. 2. Again, prayer cannot be meritorious, for if it were so it would seem natural that prayer should especially merit that for which we actually pray. Yet this is not always the case, for even the prayers of the saints are often not heard. St. Paul, for example, was not heard when he prayed that the sting of the flesh might be taken away from him. But we must notice that our merit of our prayer sometimes lies in something quite different from what we beg for. For whereas merit is to be especially referred to the possession of God, our petitions in our prayers at times often directly to other things, as we have pointed out above. Consequently, if what a man asks for will not tend to his ultimate attainment of God, he does not merit it by his prayer. Sometimes, indeed, by asking and desiring such a thing, he may lose all merit. As, for example, if a man were to ask God something which was sinful and which he could not reverently ask for, Sometimes, however, what he asks for is not necessary for his salvation, nor yet is it clearly opposed to his salvation. When a man so prays, he may, by his prayer, merit eternal life, but he does not merit to obtain what he actually asks for. Hence, St. Augustine says, He who asks of God in faith things need needful for his life is sometimes mercifully heard and sometimes mercifully not heard. For the physician knows better than the patient what will avail for the sick man. It was for this reason that Paul was not heard when he asked that the sting of flesh might be taken away. For it was not expedient. But if what a man asks for will help him to the attainment of God, as being something conducive to his salvation, he will merit it, and that not only praying for it, but by doing other good works. Hence, too, he undoubtedly will obtain that he asks for, but when it is fitting that he should obtain it, for some things are not refused to us, but are deferred to be given at a fitting time as St. Augustine says. Yet even here, hindrance may arise if a man does not persevere in asking. Hence St. Basil says, When then you ask and do not receive, this is either because you ask for what you ought not, or because you asked without lively faith, or carelessly, or for what would not profit you because you cease to ask. And since man cannot, absolutely speaking, merit eternal life from for another, nor, in consequence, those things which belong to eternal life, it follows that a man is not always heard when he prays for another. For a man, then, to obtain what he asks, four conditions must occur. He must ask for himself, for things necessary for salvation. He must ask pious, piously and preservingly. 3. Lastly, prayer essentially reposes upon faith. As St. James says, But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. But faith is not sufficient for merit, as is evident in the case of those who have faith without charity. Therefore prayer is not meritorious. But while it is true that prayer rests principally upon faith, this is not for its power of meriting, for it regards this as rests principally on charity, but for its power of winning favors. For though faith man knows the divine omnipotence and mercy, 
whence prayer obtains what it asks. St. Augustine Men, then, love different things, and when each one seemeth to have what he loves, he is called happy. But a man is truly happy, not if he has what he loves, but if he loves what ought to be loved. For many become more wretched through having what they love rather than where they lacked it. Miserable enough through love, loving harmful things, more miserable through having them. And our merciful God, when we love amiss, denies us what we love. But sometimes his anger, he grants a man what he loves amiss. But when we love what God wishes us to love, it is doubtless he will give it to us. This is that one thing which ought to be loved, that we may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of our life. St. Augustine In those tribulations, then, which can both profit us and harm us, we know not what we should pray for as we ought, yet none the less they are hard, since they are vexatious, since, too, they are opposed to our sense of our own weakness. Mankind with one consent prays that they may be removed from us, but we owe this much to the devotion to our God. If he refuses to remove them, we should not therefore fancy that we are neglected by him, but while, but while bearing these woes with devout patience, we should hope for some greater good. For thus is power perfected in infirmity. Yet to some in their impatience the Lord grants in anger what they ask, just as his mercy he refused it to the apostle. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and my supplication. Give ear to my tears. Be not silent, for I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. O oh, forgive me, that I may be refreshed, before I go hence, and be no more. 16. Do sinners gain anything from God by their prayers? St. Augustine says, If God did not hear sinners, in vain would the publican have said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And St. Chrysostom says, Every one that asketh receiveth, that is, whether he a just man or a sinner. Since Hence the prayers of sinners do win something from God. In a sinner we have to consider two things his nature, which God loves, his fault, which God hates. If, then, a sinner asks something of God formally as a sinner, that is, according to his sinful desires, God, out of his mercy, does not hear him, though sometimes he does hear him in his vengeance, as when he permits a sinner to fall still farther in, into sin. For God, in mercy, refuses some things which in anger he concedes, as St. Augustine says. But that prayer of a sinner, which proceeds from the good desire of his nature, God hears, not, indeed, as bound in justice to do so. For that the sinner cannot merit, but out of his pure mercy and on condition, too, that the four above mentioned conditions are observed, namely that he prays for himself, for things needful for his sal salvation, that he prays devoutly and perseveringly. Some, however, maintain that sinners do not by their prayers win anything from God. Thus, one, it is said in the gospel, now we know that God doth not hear sinners, and this accords with the words of Proverbs, he that turneth away his ears from hearing the law, his prayer shall be an abomination. But a prayer which is an abomination cannot win anything from God. But, as St. Augustine remarks, the words first quoted are due to the blind man as yet unanointed, yet not perfectly illumined, 
and hence they are not valid. Though they might be true if understood of a sinner precisely as such, and in this sense, too, his prayer is said to be an abomination. 2. Again, just men obtain from God what they merit, as we have said above. Sinners, however, can merit nothing, since they are without grace, even without charity, which, according to the gloss on his words, having an appearance of piety, but denying the power thereof, is the power of piety. Hence they cannot pray piously, which, as we have said above, is requisite if prayer is to gain what it asks for. But through a sinner cannot pray piously in the sense that his prayer springs from the habit of virtue, yet his prayer can be pious in the sense that he asks for something conducive to piety, just as a man who has not got the habit of justice can yet wish for some just thing, as we have pointed out above. And though such a man's prayer is not meritorious, it may yet have the power of winning favors. For while merit reposes upon justice, the power of winning favors repose upon grace. 3. Lastly, St. Chrysostom says, The Father does not readily hear prayers not dictated by the Son. But in the prayer which Christ dictated it is said, Forgive us our debts, and we also forgive our debtors, which sinners do not. Hence sinners either lie when they say this prayer, so do not deserve to be heard, or if they do not say it, then they are not heard because they do not make use of the form of prayer instituted by Christ. But, as we have explained above, the Lord's Prayer is spoken in the name of the whole church. Consequently, if a man, while unwilling to forgive his neighbor his debts, yet says this prayer, he does not lie. For while he says is not true as regards himself, it yet remains true as regards the person of the church outside, and of which he deservedly is, and he loses, in consequence, the fruit of his prayer. Sometimes, however, sinners are ready to forgive their debtors, and consequently their prayers are heard, in accordance with those words of Ecclesiasticus, Forgive thy neighbor if he hath hurt thee and then thy sins shall be forgiven when thou prayest. With the Lord shall the steps of a man be directed, and he shall well like it this way. When he shall fall, he shall not be bruised, for the Lord putteth his hand under him. I have been young, now I am old, and I have not seen the just forsaken, nor his seed seeking bread. Chapter 17 can we rightly term supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving parts of prayer? The Apostle says to Timothy, I desire therefore first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made by all men. For prayer three things are required. First of all, that he who prays comes nigh to God, and this is signified by the name prayer, for prayer is the uplifting of the mind towards God. Secondly, petition is required, and is signified by the word postulation. Now a petition may be set forth in definite terms, and this same and this same term postulation, properly so called, or may be sent forth in no express terms, as when a man asks for God's health, and this some call supplication, or, again, the fact in question may be simply narrated, as in St. John, He whom thou lovest is sick, and this some call insinuation. For thirdly, there is required a reason for asking for what we pray for, and this reason may either be on the part of God, 
or on the part of the petitioner. The reason for asking on the part of God is his holiness, by reason of which we ask to be heard. Incline thine ear and hear for thine own sake. O oh my God, to this belongs obsecration, namely a, an appeal to sacred things, as when we say, By thy nativity deliver us, O Lord. But the reason for asking on the part of the petitioner is thankfulness, for by giving thanks for benefits already received, we merit to receive still greater ones, as is set forth in the church's collect. Hence the gloss says that in the Mass, obsecrations are the prayers which precede the consecration. For in them we commemorate certain sacred things. In the consecration itself we have prayers. For then the mind is especially uplifted towards God. But in the subsequent petitions we have postulations. And the close thanksgivings, these four parts of prayer may be noticed in many of the church's collects. Thus in the collect for Trinity Sunday, the words Almighty and Everlasting God signify the uplifting of the soul to prayer to God. The words Who hast granted to thy servants to acknowledge in their profession of the true faith the, the glory of its eternal trinity and in the power of its majesty to adore its dignity. Signifying giving of thanks, the words grant we beseech thee, that by perseverance in the same faith we may ever be defended from all adversities. Signify postulation with the closing words, through our Lord Jesus Christ, etc. Signify obsecration. In the conferences of the Fathers, however, we read, obsecration is imploring pardon for sin. Prayer is when we make vows to God. Postulation is when we make petitions for others. Giving of thanks, those ineffable outpourings by which the mind renders thanks to God. But the former explanation is preferable. Some, however, object to these divisions of prayer. Thus, one, obsecration, is apparently to swear 1. Obsecration is apparently to swear by somebody, whereas Origen remarks, A man who desires to live in accordance with the gospel must not swear by anybody, for if it is not allowed to swear, neither is it allowed to swear by anyone. But it is sufficient to remark that obsecration is not a swearing by or adjuring to God, as though to compel him for this is forbidden, but to implore his mercy, too. Again, St. John Damascene says that prayer is the asking God for things that are fitting. Hence, it is not exact to distinguish prayers from postulations. But prayer, generally considered, embraces all the above-mentioned parts. When, however, we distinguish one part against another, Prayer, properly speaking, means the uplifting of the human mind. 3. Lastly, giving of thanks refers to the past, whereas the other parts of prayer refer to the future. Hence, giving of thanks should not be placed after rest. But, whereas, in things which are differ different from one another, the past precedes the future. In one and the same thing, the future precedes the past. Hence giving of thanks for benefits already received precedes petition. Yet the, those same benefits were first asked for, and then, when they had been received, thanks were offered to, for them. Prayer, however, precedes petition, for by it we draw nigh to God to whom we make petition, and obsecration precedes prayer. For it is from dwelling upon the divine goodness that we venture to approach to him. Cajetan.
We might be asked how the mind can be specially elevated to God at the moment of consecration. For in the consecration the priest has to express distinctly the words of consecration and consequently cannot have his mind uplifted towards God at that moment. Indeed, the more his mind is uplifted to God, the less he thinks of inferior things, words, and so forth. But in the consecration of the Holy Eucharist, in which the priest, in a sense, brings God down upon earth, the very greatness of our uplifting of mind towards divine goodness, which we have thus deigned to come amongst us in the very reason for our attention to the words in the act of consecration, and makes the priest pronounce them distinctly and reverently. Some scru scrupulous folk, however, concentrate their whole attention on being intent and attentive, but this is really a distraction and not attention, for its object is precisely the being attentive. Uplifting, then, of our minds to God in the consecration has indeed to be very greatest, not, indeed, intensive, and by abstraction from the things of sense, but objectively and concentrated, though always within the limits compatible with attention, on the endeavor to say the words as they should be said. St. Augustine And David went in and sat before the Lord. And Elias, casting himself down upon the earth, put his face between his knees. By examples such as these we are taught that there is no prescribed position of the body in prayer provided the soul states its intention in the presence of God. For we pray standing, as it is written, the publican standing far of, afar off. We pray, too, on our knees, as we read in the Acts of the Apostles. And we pray sitting, as in the case of David and Elijah, and unless it were lawful to pray lying down, it would not be said in the Psalms, Every night I will wash my bed, I will water my couch with my tears. When, then, a man desires to pray, he settles himself in any position that serves at the time for stirring up the soul. And when, on the other hand, we have no definite intention of praying, but the wish to pray suddenly occurs to us, when, that is, there comes of a sudden into our minds something which rouses the desire to pray with unspeakable groanings, then, in whatsoever position such as a feeling may find us, we are not to put off our prayer. We are not to look about for some place whither we can withdraw, for some place in which to stand in or to make prostration. For the very intention of the mind begets a solitude, and we often forget to which quarter of the heavens we were looking, or in what bodily position the occasion found us. Hear, O God, my prayer, and despise not my supplication. Be attentive to me and hear me. I am grieved in my exercise. I am troubled at the voice of the enemy and at the tribulation of the sinner. For they have cast iniquities upon me, and in wrath they were troublesome to me. My heart is troubled within me, and the fear of death is fallen upon me. Fear and trembling are come upon me, the darkness that covered me. And I said, Who will give me wings like a dove? And I will fly and be at rest.